Um, uh, good morning. A very warm welcome to this London Climate Action Week event on closing the gender gap in uh, climate and security. It's being organised by International Alert and Chatham House. Uh, my name is Ollie Brown. I'm an Associate Fellow with the Energy, Environment and Resources Programme at Chatham House, and I have the great pleasure of moderating this really fascinating event. And it's it's part of a whole series of events being organized by Chatham House this week and next, or this week, sorry, on, on a whole variety of themes, on climate risk, China, circular economy, uh, climate justice. I think we will um, post a link to some of the other events if you care to join us on those as well. Um, some, some really interesting discussions happening this week around these really important issues. We are gonna spend the next hour talking about the intersection of climate change, security, and gender. Um, we all know that the climate crisis disproportionately affects fragile, conflict-affected states, um, those states that are contributing least to global emissions, uh, but they, affect, they, they face some of the starkest impacts of climate change. And within those countries, um, climate change is affecting men and women, boys and girls, in different ways. And so we are going to dive into this, talking about some of the deeply rooted gender norms, expectations and roles that lead to different impacts and shape the different kind of coping and adaptation strategies uh, that, that different people have from different genders, generations, eth ethnicities, religions, uh, abilities, or sexual orientations. And broadly, if we avoid or if we ignore these dynamics, we risk creating new vulnerabilities, uh, risk reinforcing existing inequalities, and, and critically um, risk missing important ways to deal with the climate crisis. So we're gonna be diving into, I guess, the following questions. The first is, how do the security implications of climate change affect men and women, boys and girls in different ways? And the second is, is what critically can be done to address some of these challenges? Um, and in particular, to, to kind of recognize the need for and to ensure a gender and conflict sensitive lens to climate change adaptation. To discuss this over the next hour, we have four wonderful speakers, uh, a peace builder, an environmentalist, uh, an activist, and a UN staff member. Um, I'll introduce each properly before they speak, um, but what will happen is each will give some opening comments, we'll have a bit of a discussion and move on to the, to the next person. And the second half of the hour is really gonna be open for questions from, from you, the, the participants, um, and, uh, and so we would really welcome your questions. You can, you'll see, at the bottom right of your screen, there's a question and answer function. So please do add in any questions as people speak. Um, it would be helpful if you could identify if there's somebody in particular you're focusing your question towards and, and where you're coming from as well. Uh, and then what you'll see is other people can vote on those questions. And so the questions that get the most votes will sort of automatically float to the surface. Uh, and I'll try and ask those of our participants. Um, so we'll, 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 keep, we'll keep those questions coming in. Um, and, uh, and I'll try to get it to as many as we can in the, in the second half of the discussion. But let's go straight in. Um, our first speaker is uh, Camille Market, who works for International Alert. And he is supporting International Alert's work on climate security and conflicts uh, around issues uh, of the access to natural resources, such as land, water and forests. Um, before this, he worked on human rights, good governance and security related issues in the po post-Soviet space. So, um, Kami, the screen is yours. Thank you, Oli. Um, so first of all, um, I wanted to say that the, the discussion on climate security, that is realizing that uh, climate change has an impact on ongoing conflicts and stability, so this discussion on climate security has taken a, a big leap forward last year. Uh, and at International Alert, we identified that gender was sometimes missing in this discussion. So in order to better understand the interlinks between climate, environmental degradation, gender, and political instability, we worked with three of our country offices in Mali, Lebanon, and Myanmar to define what a, a peace building approach to gender and climate may look like. Uh, so what we found is that Conflicts and political instability is an additional barrier for affected communities to prepare and adapt to the climate crisis. And gender inequality and social marginalization uh, further increases vulnerability to climate change. Uh, women and girls are not only victims of violence due to resource scarcity, but their livelihood can also be affected by those uh, double impacts. 
So the international community needs to be careful when it wants to support adaptation efforts in this context, as adaptation programs also impact societal dynamics and can perpetuate gender inequality. So a key takeaway of our uh, research last year was that missing the gender lens will lead to weaker solutions. And indeed, by including certain actors, women, youth, or the socially marginalized communities, you risk to design imperfect programs that could become the source for new grievances. And that is why a conflict sensitive and a gender sensitive approach is crucially needed. So two moments is important to deliver that, uh, both in terms of analysis before the action and the approach you take to programming. So on analysis, you need to develop a more granular understanding of the context you operate in. And that goes through three phases. So the first one is exploring the differentiated effects of conflict and climate change on women and men of different ages and social backgrounds. And a key question to ask yourself then is, whose voices are we missing and who is traditionally not represented around, uh, around these issues? So the benefit of such an approach, uh, of such a comprehensive gender approach, so looking beyond binarity of men and women, but also integrating questions of ability and generation, it allows to, to avoid an oversimplification of social dynamics in a society. Uh, the second step for a good gender analysis is to look at the agency of uh, the different gender categories. Um, th that is looking at the way they already respond to climate change effects and to conflict stress and their ability to do so. Um, so this way they respond can be positive and in, in this case it's good practice or negative and in this case we call that maladaptation. Uh, so the benefit of focusing on agency allows for um, allows to view women or youth or marginalized community not only as victims, but on the contrary, as full societal actors who can bring solutions to these challenges. So the third step in the analysis is to recognize the cultural barriers to representation in terms of access to education, access to formation, uh, and understanding um, household and community expectations. So, um, additionally, in terms of programming approach, uh, we need to really put gender transformation at the center of any action and not only gender programming. And this goes through having the ambition to address structural gender inequalities. So on, on uh, climate related issues, it means recognizing differences in terms of access to land, ownership of land or control of economic assets. But in order to do that in very patriarchal societies, you need to do no harm. And in order to do that, it's key to capitalize on existing representation networks. Um, so NGOs, women association, indigenous groups, youth groups, unions, and cooperatives. So that I just wanted to open with these few general principles and ideas on how to close the gender gap in climate adaptation. I mean, thank you. I think that was a brilliant setup for for the discussion that we're we're, we're going to have. I mean, setting out some of the some of the challenges. You know, conflict increases vulnerability um, to climate change. Adaptation itself can exacerbate existing. Um, you know, has an impact on social dynamics, and that broadly, if we if we ignore these gender aspects, we miss opportunities both to address the impacts of climate change and to address um, inequalities in terms of in terms of uh, you know addressing gender inequalities that exist already i guess my question for you is is how do we you, you've set out the kind of context how do we take this forward how do we what are the entry points to kind of talk about such issues so yeah as i, as I said um i started by saying that there's um, increasing recognition of these links and increasing will to act on it uh, and there's already a, a growing body of methodologies and tools that, that can allow us to look at that in a more uh, deeper way. So there are international frameworks that exist and that are not entirely um, gathering these different topics um, and who are, or who are still under development. Uh, for example, you can look into the interactions of different uh, sustainable development goals like uh, the SDG number five on gender equality the number 13 on uh, climate action and the number 16 on peaceful institution and how all the indicators of these different SDGs interact and can, uh, and can be of support. Um, some countries like the, the Netherlands are also integrating in their, um, 
uh, Women, Peace and Security Agenda, that is the 1325 um, National Action Plan. They're integrating considerations around uh, resources, uh, livelihood management, uh, that, that are key to the climate change link. Um, and in this way, uh, the UN Security Council Resolution 2242 already opens that climate change is a topic for the WPS agenda. And um, yeah, and, and finally, there's other tools like the UNF Triple C's Lima Work uh, Program on Gender. Uh, but we really need an implementation leap of these frameworks and, and more connection between uh, local examples, local activists, and, and these frameworks. Camille, brilliant. That was, a, that was a wonderful segue into our second speaker, who's, I guess, going to talk about some of this, these links with local good practices, local actors. So I'm going to turn now to um, Asma El Hajal, who is with the Lebanon Rainforest Reforestation Initiative. Uh, and uh, Asma is a, an environmentalist with a background in public health, and her current research and professional work concentrate on forest fire management in Lebanon. And what I wanted to do, Asma, is kind of turn the screen to you and get you to talk a little bit about the situation in Lebanon, how the economic crisis, uh, climate crisis is, is, is having an impact on um, gender, some of the gender issues in Lebanon. So the screen is yours. Thank you, Asma. Thank you, Oli, for uh, the introduction. Um, so needless to say, like uh, Lebanon's current economic collapse is worsening the impacts of climate change. And Lebanon is faced with water shortages, severely polluted rivers like the cancerous Litani River, city and air pollution from car exhaust fumes and high temperatures causing detrimental fires that are really um, difficult to contain. They all affect the most vulnerable. At this point, local authorities have zero budget and cannot support the residents. And public agencies are also out of resources. For example, the Civil Defense Department, whose units are mostly made up of volunteers, are actually running on scarce individual the, the donations and contributions from these volunteers. Now, the impact of climate change, like drought and forest fires, are usually alleviated through the private purchase of needed resources, and communities can no longer afford the private purchases to, for example, compensate for water shortage. And these affect uh, dense urban environments where water sources are salinated, like in Beirut under the uh, Palestinian camps there. They also cause conflict in rural areas like the Bekaa and Afsir. This further increases risks on the vulnerable, especially women who do not hold control over financial or natural resources in most cases. Also, in our, in our culture, women are the keepers of the house. They are responsible for water usage. Women are responsible of cleaning and maintaining the household, especially after a disaster like a flood or a fire smoke. In many cases, women are uh, the, uh, the first viewers of, of a fire as they are um, like stagnant in one place. Now, due to the financial struggles, and especially after the Beirut blast, uh, the Lebanese and Syrian communities are moving away from urban areas, and many are moving into villages to save costs and ensure food through farming. Despite this being romanticized as a positive behavior, it causes stress on natural resources. Um, unfortunately, I have to say that negative activities such as logging and quarrying are usually led by men who own the lands and who are responsible for providing for the family. And the migration might also affect the, the access to education, especially uh, for girls in Lebanon. And the education rate is lower in rural areas, actually. Now, um, I would like uh, to also add that it would be ideal to talk about climate change mitigation through pollution reduction. But I see that this has a long way to go before becoming tangibly seen in Lebanon. The business as usual model is highly embedded in the complicated and corrupt political structure, both locally and nationally. And um, as I personally chose to do, I see that climate change mitigation and adaptation might see a light through nature conservation, community engagement, and the building of sense of place and environmental ethics. So caring for the land or planting a tree cannot but bring a basis for common ground and understanding. And it creates a ripple effect of positive behavior either socially or environmentally. Now, I'm currently part uh, of the Lebanon Deforestation Initiative NGO, as you mentioned, and it applies nature-based solutions with local communities and authorities, such as landscape restoration, forest and fire management, ecotourism planning, and agroforestry. And agroforestry uh, compartment really closes the loop of also producing in the natural environment, producing food. 
While the economic situation in Lebanon was getting worse, LRI, as well as other NGOs in Lebanon, uh, directed their projects towards livelihood enhancement through a gendered approach, directed by a gender strategy. This ensures a gendered quota in labor. So uh, we ensure a 50-50% participation between men and women, or push for it at least, for Lebanese, Syrian, and people of other nationality. We identified women organizations and cooperatives and answers women's needs to be included in activities not perceived to fit in women's roles. We also recognize active women and uh, show them as champions and uh, uh, make their role as mitigators uh, in the local municipality. Uh, for example, uh, we have a woman called Huda in uh, Doha who uh, actually has a forest named after her at this point, and she is the contact point for our NGO in the village there. Uh, we also create market channels, for example, uh, women in English produce uh, forest-based products and new name that are sold through LRI, and uh, other market channels for soap productions uh, for women in the Bekaa. Um, now, another example is uh, the village of Yamune, where tribal dynamics are still prevalent. While men uh, still take on agricultural work and travel to find jobs, a group of women has taken charge of watching over the forest. In the same village, the daughter of the head of the municipality started a yearly festival to promote tourism. Through locally based projects, young women in rural areas are provided with jobs and trainings, and there is a massive need to maintain such activities and create and support projects that sustain and promote the role of these women. And despite being able to take on labor intensive uh, activities, women are more at ease actually uh, on taking on managerial tasks and they can be highly involved in education and communication. And a good way to promote this is to provide paid trainings and funded projects and job positions to young women and promote their roles as educators and as e key actors in conflict resolution and keepers of the land. Now, on the national level, I wish to see more uh, collaborative projects between the Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Agriculture, and Ministry of Tourism, and move away from conventional tourism and promote agricultural and ecotourism as uh, a diversified and women-inclusive economy, since women can produce goods from, the, from home and are also linked to hospitability. Um, international organizations are encouraged to follow the organic course of events that have led communities to go back to the land and support it through sustainable local projects that ensure food security, recreation, and direct financial input. It is also very essential to act on the need to either directly influence the communities or do it through local and small-scale organizations while ensuring the inclusion and participation of women. Um, so that was um, my note. Uh, yeah. Asma, thank you so much. I mean, I, what came back to me, I think, really interestingly is I guess two points one is that as we all know climate change is not happen happening in a vacuum it's interacting with all sorts of other factors in Lebanon the the very dire financial crisis the de-urbanization people moving back to rural areas uh, you know it, it's just interacting with all of these climate change challenges as well as some of the existing challenges around you know different access to resources and so on so I think you put that out really well and then also from a kind of positive point of view, what can be done at a very local scale to try and address some of these things and the different initiatives that are happening between local communities and, and, and governments. You were talking a little bit about collaborative projects between the different ministries and communities. I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on that and, and sort of in this context in Lebanon when, you know, there's very limited government money, there's very limited resources for this. How can national governments and local communities work together to kind of address some of these challenges? Can you just speak a, for a couple of minutes around that? Thank you. Um, yes, so um, the role that uh, the international community has at the stage and even the local non-governmental organization is very, very important and very, very big. Since uh, the government has a very big vacuum of funds, uh, there is a big need for external influx uh, of money. And this is mostly what is a bit like uh, building uh, a decent ground and a decent decentralized way. So um, what, uh, what uh, I would hope to see is uh, a collaboration uh, between the international organizations 
and uh, the ministries to involve more the municipalities and empower the municipalities as local actors. And uh, by uh, pushing for climate change agendas and gender-centered uh, agendas with these decentralized and local uh, authorities, uh, we are skewing the caliber into a very progressive uh, mindset in a place where it would create a ripple effect, like even if they do not accept uh, this, um, this big topic, they would find means to reach the goals because they need the resources, they need the projects, they need um, the, the flow of events that is uh, coming now. So uh, unfortunately, I would have to push for like a top down approach for gender and climate uh, topics uh, being applied uh, on the decentralized level. Um, what I would recommend also is to like bring the big topic and uh, be um, uh, inclusive to the community's opinions and uh, perception. So I would introduce uh, climate change and gender as an NGO uh, at the decentralized level and allow the community to find the tools and the tweaks to reach a certain indicator or reach a certain uh, activity. Um, so um, what uh, would also uh, be good to have is to build the capacity of women to lead on mediate, uh, mediating environmental and public health issues. Uh, so by doing that also we would be uh, applying capacity building uh, activities. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Asma. Really interesting. So sort of top down, but letting communities deal and develop their own responses in their own um, particular way. I see there's some comments coming in on the chat. Um, and actually, I'm going to, I'm just making a mental note, I'm going to come back to Camille and put him on the spot to talk a little bit more about some of these frameworks, not, not yet, but when we in the question and answer, because I see there were some questions around the Lima, the Lima framework and the IPCC gender plan. And so maybe talk about, I'm going to put Camille on the spot and ask him to talk a little bit about what, um, what else needs to be done around that and to explain a little bit about those frameworks. We have a couple of questions coming in on the question and answer um, sort of function. If you please do add any other questions, let us know who is asking the question and who your question is directed to. Um, and then, you know, if you find questions are particularly interesting, you particularly want to, um, you had the same question in your mind, but rather than writing it out, you can just uh, upvote that question and it'll float to the top in my, in my list of questions. So with that, let us turn to our third speaker. We're moving from Lebanon um, across west to the Sahel. Um, and we're gonna turn to Oladosu, Oladosu Adenike Titilope from Nigeria. Uh, Adenike is an eco-feminist, um, a climate justice activist, and an eco-reporter. Uh, and her work encourages um, youth involvement in climate action through climate education and raising awareness uh, on the importance of women's environmental rights. She is the founder of an organization called I Lead Climate, which is a youth-led movement raising awareness about climate change induced problems in conflict zones uh, and African societies for disarmament. So Adenike, tell us a bit about the situation where you are. The screen is yours, thank you. Okay, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, this um, important topic is, it talks more about the climate and security impacts on gender equality. And I must tell you that um, situations like this are everyday reality to us here in the um, Global South, especially in the Lake Chad region. We advocate for the recharge or the restoration of Lake Chad because we are seeing it. We have seen that two thirds of those 10.7 million plus people that are this girls. And this is um, due to the fact that women livelihood depends on these natural resources that are depleting every day. So it calls for gender smart response. And how do we make this possible? Women produce like 60 to 80% of the world's food but have little or no access to land. And making them having this access to land, finance, and other things that is needed is going to help improve not only gender equality, but also food security, um, help reduce poverty, and zero hunger. So all I'm trying to, 
um, achieve that when it is time for uh, when it is drought or flood, that in um, bride um, bride child marriage because little children that ought to be in schools or to be educated or to be change makers are bearing the burden of this climate change crisis. They are being used as a survival strategy. We are seeing it in the Sahel where more than twenty million of these girls are child brides. So to some uh, to a certain extent or to a larger extent, we will see that it's going to affect women's uh, empowerment and it's going to also disrupt gender equality. And as we need all of these issues to come towards uh, the global scene, to see how Africans are being affected and how we can call for response that are needed because issues like this, it needs us to deal with it um, in different perspective. Like we can look at initiative like the um, network of um, African environmental environmentalists where we see that they, they came up with initiative like adopting um, our landscape. So I chose to adopt that of Lake Chad because I've been seeing the impact in Nigeria, New Jay, Cameroon and Chad where it is disappropriately affecting us, it's leading to banditry, it's leading to armed conflict. And I'm going to tell you today that it is in Africa that we are seeing armed conflict. That is, being, that is making our border to be porous. We have heard about the bring back our girls, that of the Chibo school girls, the, adapt, the, the adoption of those school girls. And to a certain extent, it can be a point of no return to those girls. So we have to look at the gender side of this response. How do we make land to be accessible to women? How do we make um, um, gender um, smart education for Women, because um, an average of six thinking water for firewood, even though it caused them going to the next community to get all of these things. And the pro points that they have to lose um, their economic gain because using those um, hours in a day to sort for all of these things is going to make them to be um, depressed. So it's leading to, so the energy poverty is making women to be um, disempowered. And it's going to make girls to drop out of school because like their family. In the process, they can't meet up with their academic work. And to a certain extent, women are change makers in different forms. So we have to create equality in all of these things. When we are talking about gender response, we don't need taking, taking the space of male. We need to balance it up. We need to see that this in, in, imbalances is really affecting our community. We also need to look at what the Women Environmental Program too is doing around the world concerning women program trying to in, um, intercept gender responsive approach. Um, it's, a, it's founded in Nigeria, but it's all over different um, countries. So we also need to look at different programs like that of the Great Green War Initiative. If we want it to be successful, then we have to localize it. We have to see, we have to make community know that they are the owner of this initiative. We have to start from the community level in all of this initiative. We have to make them know that this initiative belongs to them, it's for them. And so doing, it's going to make them to be the custodian of such initiative because by now, we should have been able to actualize the Great Green War Initiative that started since 2007. You know, it's a huge project that is capable of helping to um, close these gender disparities or um, inequalities. So we also need to look in, inward to different initiatives that community members, women will be part of this initiative, not just initiative at the government level alone. We also need to localize this initiative that we are bringing from the government perspective so that people become, um, people become part of it. Then they see it as their own, as the people's projects, not the government project. So all of this initiative is needed because women are really facing the brunt of the climate change crisis. We are seeing it in the farmer X-Men cl um, clashes that is happening in Nigeria, where we are losing our fertile landscape um, degradation, desertification, drought, and people are moving uh, to the to the central, 
And once there's problem in the central, it's going to affect every other state. I schooled in the food basket of the nation, Makodi in Nigeria. And this is the landscape that is fatter. It is called the food basket because it produces the bulk of the food production and it has fatter landscape. But now it is becoming, it is fast becoming a conflict ground because people are trying to survive. There are little of these natural resources to cater for the rising population. And that is why our population is becoming vulnerable to the impact of climate change crisis. So we had to look at all of these things to create fund for conflict affected areas. And that is why the elite climate is a Pan-African movement trying to raise awareness, trying to find solutions to all of these crises. How do we move ahead? How do we move beyond um, just waiting for our government? How do we do all of this initiative without fund? You know, there should be fund provided to the fragile countries and states that are affected by conflict because we are seeing climate change as, um, as new conflicts. And in the nearest decade, it can become another form of conflict that we might not be able to bear. So climate change is already a reality. We are seeing it, it's an everyday issue, the flood, the drought. And when there's flood and drought, that is when we have the highest rate of child brides, using them as a survival strategy to stabilize the family. So all of these things, we need to put them into account. So I'm speaking to people that are, in, that are policy makers, that are in government, that all of this implemented, all of these things that we'll, be, we'll speak about today, it should be implemented. We should find ways to create um, solutions out of this um, talking point today. Thank you so much. Adenike, thank you so much. In five minutes, you managed to tie together um, so many issues under this, this sort of, you know, the links to climate change, energy poverty, water, droughts, agriculture, migration, um, education, gender empowerment, social balance, conflict. I mean, again, showing how all of these things come together within the context of community action and, and, and what can be done to make communities, I guess, owners of you know, the change yeah. that they need to see to, to address some of these issues. What I would like to do, if I can, is, is, is just to ask you, what sort of actions would you like to see? You've touched on this a little bit, I guess, in terms of funding, but what kind of action would you like to see from the international community, some of the people on in this kind of virtual meeting today, in terms of supporting communities in Niger or Chad or Nigeria to address some of these issues? How does, how does the international community kind of support this? Over to you. Quickly. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. That's a very important um, um, question because um, we have been speaking a lot. So now we, we need them to come up with, we, we have solutions that have been derived from this platform now from different speakers trying to bring their own perspective. So now it is time for them to look at initiatives that have been done or that, can, can, that they can bring up from this kind of conversation like that of the fund for fragile countries on how they can strengthen their, their resilience and um, gender um, angle so that it could help them to, to cope or it could increase the adaptation level because once we are faced with insecurity, it might affect, um, it might divide our attention from climate issue because right now we are seeing different security threats, increase in kidnapping, um, the Boko Haram and every other crisis that is happening. So it's really covering climate change. So these are things that will be seen if we don't take necessary actions. These are things that will be seen if we don't place fund where necessary, we might end up using fund that is needed for climate change to tackle another form of insecurity. So we have to be looking at um, solutions like that of the Great Green Wall Initiative. Who are the people that they are involved in? Who are they talking to? Who are beyond the government? Who are those, what, which organizations are they evolving that are part of this community, not distant from the community? So we have to know who we are talking to, um, those who, are, who we are involving beyond government, because we know that government must be part of all of this um, initiative in different communities. But we also look at um, those, um, the community leaders, because as an agricultural economist, I found out that if you are bringing an initiative on board and you don't talk to the community leaders, it's like no work done. 
So you have to involve them. So we have to carry out the right solution in the right direction. Sometimes we are bringing the right solution on board, but we are not looking at the right direction. So we have to put into, uh, we have to put different consideration for different perspective on how it can work. And we have to make it work because we don't have time. Thank you. Uh, Adenike, thank you so much. That was, that was brilliant. Um, so we've been talking about the role of the international community. I'm not going to ask Celia to, to talk on behalf of the entire international community, but she does work for the United Nations. Uh, she's our fourth speaker. Um, Celia is a program manager. Celia Halley is a program manager with the UN Environment Program, uh, and she's currently responsible for a, a very big, important project uh, with the EU on looking at a, a partnership around climate change and security. Um, which is working to develop some of those integrated responses that Adenike was talking about just now at the country level, as well as advising on policy developments at the global level. Uh, at the same time, she's leading projects uh, ranging from environmental climate risk assessments um, to field projects aimed at using climate adaptation interventions to reduce conflict and build peace in crisis affected countries. So a lot of the issues that we've been talking about today already, she's currently overseeing work in Darfur, the Blue Nile State in Sudan, as well as Mali, Cote d'Ivoire, and Nepal. And I see we have some friends from Nepal as well in the, in the chat. Um, Celia joined UNEP in 2009 um, and has held several roles in the organization, um, managing in particular, relevant for this discussion here, a joint UN environment program, UNDP, UN Women, and Department of um, Peacebuilding and P Political Affairs, program on gender, natural resources, climate and peace. So exactly the kind of nexus of things we're talking about today. Um, just to, as a quick reminder, I see lots of great questions are coming in. If you find a question particularly interesting, do kind of click on the little thumbs up icon next to it and that upvotes it and, and sort of gives it, um, you know, makes it float to the top. Um, and what we'll do is we'll try and get to as many of those questions as we can. I see a couple of questions are coming in to the chat box. And can I just remind you, it'd be more helpful for me if you could put those into the Q&A function, because then, then they'll all be in one place for me to see. But with that, let me turn to Celia. Talk to us about the role of the international community and, um, and what can the international community do on these issues. Over to you. Thanks so much, Ali, and um, and thanks to uh, International Alert and, and Chatham House, and congratulations in particular to International Alert on the guidance note. Um, it's really a, a significant and very practical contribution to to this rapidly growing field, and it's really great um, to see uh, some some very practical guidance coming out of there. Um, so I think I was uh, I was the, the organizers were hoping I would speak a little bit to some of the programming initiatives that are taking place um, in uh, at this kind of nexus of climate change and security and, and and gender equality, but let me just start with a couple words of context just to say and Ollie and I who have been involved in this field for quite some time will recognize what Camille was saying uh, earlier about how incredibly changed. Um, the context is from even five years ago in terms of the significant recognition that climate security risks have um, have drawn from the international community. We now have, you know, Security Council debates on the issues. We have Security Council mandates given to peacekeeping operations. We have um, institutional uh, structures like the climate security mechanism within the UN that has been set up recently to coordinate some of this work. So it's really, it's a very exciting time. Um, and I think we, we, we're all kind of imbued with a sense of opportunity, especially since a lot of the kind of leading donors um, are also taking an interest in this work and interested in, in, in supporting some of these um, advances in programming. But it's true that, I mean, to date, a lot of the focus at the international level has been on analysis and assessments. Uh, it's been on kind of building the evidence base and making the case for why you would uh, consider issues such as climate change within um, kind of security and conflict prevention programming. Um, and there has been a little bit less done on programming, but there have been a number of early attempts. Uh, I think, you know, as Ollie was mentioning, uh, I've been involved in, in some of these um, ranging from kind of do no harm approaches where, you know, climate change adaptation projects would seek to be conflict sensitive or the other way around all the way to kind of attempts at developing genuine integrated approaches. And, and as you've mentioned, UNEP has been involved in the last few years in developing some of this integrated programming that seeks to simultaneously achieve um, climate resilience and peace building goals, uh, but also um, gender equality and social inclusion. So it's kind of developing these win-win-win strategies, so to speak. 
Um, so the general um, premise of this work, uh, which Asma and Adenike both um, alluded to, is really that interventions that build resilience uh, to the impacts of climate change are really important entry points uh, for social cohesion, for building trust, for building cooperation, but in particular for strengthening women's kind of meaningful participation in reducing um, conflict and security risks from uh, the impacts of climate change. So for example, we've, we were involved um, together with other UN agencies in a, in a project, a pilot project in North Kordofan in Sudan, uh, in communities that are of course highly impacted by environmental degradation and by sort of linked um, increasing local conflict between uh, communities, livelihood communities, such as farmers and, and nomadic pastoralists, uh, which are being exacerbated by, by climate change. And this project, uh, I don't have the time to go into a lot of detail now, but suffice it to say that it, it sought to demonstrate how interventions around climate resilient livelihoods and environmental planning and decision-making could empower women to become leaders um, in their communities uh, fight against climate change, as well as agents of peace, uh, preventing and resolving uh, disputes uh, and conflicts linked to natural resources. So that project had uh, particularly promising results. We were very successful in, in, in significantly increasing uh, women's income, for example, which allowed women to um, not only participate more uh, in their communities, but also send their daughters to school, for example, but also in strengthening women's roles uh, in leadership um, and in conflict prevention, which led to a significant shift within their communities in terms of the perception of women's roles and the perceptions of women's leadership. So we're happy that that project is now being kind of replicated and adapted in other contexts um, with the support of the, the UN Peacebuilding Fund. Um, so I think, again, I think there's a lot of interest in these, in these issues and, and uh, when there are good examples of uh, integrated solutions, uh, there are takers who are interested in replicating them. Um, so those lessons were, were, were that, that learning from that project have also been integrated into our work that you mentioned with the Euro European Union on, on, on our climate change and security partnership in which we've been running projects in um, Darfur and in Western Nepal. So these are projects that are again designed to kind of bring communities together to develop joint solutions to shared environmental problems, uh, which serves to strengthen relationships between different groups within the communities, but also to build kind of locally generated and locally owned um, the climate change adaptation strategies. So for example, building sustainable water infrastructure to improve irrigation in Nepal or designing community forests in Sudan, those kinds of activities provide kind of initial platforms for collaboration between witching groups. Uh, sometimes conflicting groups, uh, which can then be kind of nurtured uh, to create more established mechanisms for dialogue or management of natural resources, and then linking those to kind of broader governance and planning mechanisms um, at the subnational or subnational level. So I know I'm coming up to the end of my time, so I'll, I'll conclude with what could be termed kind of the key lessons learned from this work so far, um, which are that while, and this is a very important caveat, uh, no you know, one size fits all for programming is possible, especially in fragile and conflict affected contexts. We do have examples out there, um, examples of projects that make clear that when interventions are delivered in a conflict sensitive and gender responsive and socially inclusive way, um, that climate adaptation and resilience building interventions can and do contribute to peace building. Uh, especially at local levels, um, but they can also start to build the bridges to um, kind of subnational and, and national levels. And finally, and most importantly for this conversation, um, these interventions can have transformative impacts for gender equality um, and for social inclusion. So specifically targeting women or marginalized groups more broadly through activities such as sustainable livelihoods um, and natural resource management can really raise their voice in political decision-making processes and empower them in economically. And this in turn can help transform the underlying social, economic, and political drivers of conflict and insecurity in these contexts. So I'll leave it here for now, thanks. Celia, brilliant. That, that sets out really kind of positive examples of all the things that can change. It kind of ties back into Camille's point at the beginning about how this this whole area has come on, you know, significantly in the last in the last few years. We've only got fifteen minutes left, and I want to get to as many of the discussion questions as possible. There's some really great questions have come in, and I'm actually going to ask you the first one, Celia. It's mm -hmm. from Leslie uh, Abdella, um, and it's it's a really tricky one, so I'll I'll go straight <laughs> to the UN person, um, which is 
what what do you feel about this idea that the international community should refuse to fund peace talks and climate change talks which lack at least 40 percent women um, and at least uh, 40 percent men so unless there's some degree of gender balance in both peace talks and climate talks which are primarily funded by the international community um, and you know what else can be done around kind of bringing that gender dimension into into peace and climate talks so mediators uh, becoming much stronger and promoting understanding among conflict parties of the value of that kind of participation the participation that Adenike was talking about um, and that everybody needs to lobby governments UN and international organizations to use more women as lead mediators this is extremely current in the in view of the current negotiations peace negotiations in Afghanistan um, and so on so if I can just put you on the hot seat for that one, Celia, what do you think about this idea of, of using the kind of levers to in, in ensure gender diversity in both climate talks and in peace talks? Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> I mean, I think one needs to recognize that these situations are typically unbelievably complex. Um, and while I am very supportive of uh, quota type actions in a lot of areas, um, I, I would tend to uh, take a more kind of positive approach and try to help the international community understand what they should do <laughs> uh, rather than, you know, kind of provide these um, kind of complex red lines, which are very difficult to implement in, in, in all situations. Um, I mean, I think what, what is undeniable, um, I mean, all the research so shows this over the last few years is that uh, having uh, women at the table, um, and I should say, not only women, but women from diverse groups, women of different ages, women uh, from different kind of ethnic backgrounds or different um, kind of socioeconomic uh, levels and backgrounds as well. Um, while it is absolutely undeniable that women's participation is, uh, is key to um, the sustainability of uh, peace agreements and a peace, you know, the, the solutions that are, that come from peace negotiations. Um, I think it's also, you know, incumbent upon the international community rather than to, you know, put these kind of interdictions rather than to support those, uh, those women and those groups of women and networks of women to participate and to capacitate them to participate uh, at, uh, at the same level and with the same, you know, with the same tools, so to speak, as, as everyone else. So I would, I would focus more on, um, you know, if we were to do something that were to be truly transformative in terms of women's participation, in uh, in negotiations, whether it's peace negotiations or climate negotiations, I would focus more on uh, supporting uh, or building capacity. I mean, sometimes some of these negotiations are are, are really um, complex uh, and require a, a level of kind of technical knowledge um, and um, you know education that often women structurally are uh, discriminated from having. And so, a lot of what we've found to be more effective than kind of putting down putting our foot down in terms of numbers has been to um, train and capacitate women to or groups of women or their, their and, and their representations to participate um, on an equal footing uh, in some of these technical negotiations. So I would take it more from that angle. Um, I mean, obviously there are specific cases in which uh, probably uh, some, some more drastic measures can be taken. And I think in particular, perhaps in the climate negotiations, which um, are, you know, less, less of a, well, I wouldn't say less, less political, but often very, uh, you know, at, at least removed from the crisis context in which peace negotiations are, are taking place. Um, is that, is that enough of a, that's great. Of a foray? Yeah, thank you. That was a very, that was a very balanced response. I see some comments are coming in on the chat as well in response to that. Um, but let me just turn to Camille. I wanted to, I guess, do two things. One is just Give you a chance to just tell us very very quickly a little bit more about um in response to a question and chat about the lima work program on gender and the ipcc gender policy and link that to a question from hannah kernoth from adelphi um who is asking about what this idea of climate security kind of national action programs being intertwined with national action programs around women peace and security um is that a way of kind of moving forward in an intersectional way um, in, in that sort of does some of these things around inclusion um, and diversity in, in both climate action and, and addressing kind of the security impacts of that. So can you talk um, a little bit more about those, those kind of issues coming? Sure, I can. Um, to Anna's question, the, the answer would be extremely quick. Uh, it's uh, 
yes, be a good approach. Uh, but this said, uh, we need to be careful with all these frameworks to avoid replication or um, let different frameworks uh, address the same problem. Uh, so this uh, integrating uh, climate security or a consideration around uh, livelihood making or um, na uh, national resource ma natural resource management in the WPS agenda as, uh, is happening and has happened. Um, but yeah, but the, 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 the Lima Enhanced Gender Action Plan may be the, the best place to look at that. Uh, I am, they, 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 they exist since 2014, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but I'm not sure a lot of countries have actually developed them. Uh, they look into four points, uh, three points, sorry. So capacity, knowledge management, and communication. So it's really to equip um, women, girls, youth with this, this kind of knowledge and, and capacity for action. Uh, looking at gender balance in adaptation efforts as well, and, and uh, women leadership within this framework as well, and having more gender responsive implementation. So that needs to be further defined, and, and, and this mechanism needs to be more owned. Um, but yeah, but there, there are other uh, mechanisms and other, um, other frameworks that speak to uh, gender and climate. Um, so that could be the, the Beijing Platform for Action, for example. Uh, that, that's also an interesting place to look at. And I'll stop there. Kami, thank you very much. That's extremely helpful. Um, I just see in the chat and in some of the questions, people are asking for um, notes um, and, uh, and, and email addresses for the, the, the panelists. I don't think we'll put email addresses into the chat just for, um, you know, um, GB... GDPR reasons um, for, the, for the the privacy reasons, but I think if you can email the the um, the organisers, email International Alert, I'm, I'm, and perhaps introduce yourself and say who you'd like to be put in contact with. I think we can certainly we can certainly do that. So so please um, please do that by all means. Um, I wanted to link a couple of questions um, that I see in in the in the Q and A box to Asma. Um, there's one from my colleague Anna. Um, which is um, which is around how can we how can we sensitize local women in, in in communities in rural communities to understand what kind of climate change security really means uh, and to be involved in better climate um, advocacy. Asma, over to you. Um, to answer this question, uh, I would uh, go back to uh, the thought that uh, women are keepers of the house and keepers of the family. So uh, like uh, putting forth the relationship between uh, environmental uh, problems and issues and health um, is key to making women acknowledge uh, the need to act on environmental injustice. So uh, most women know that there, there is a problem and how to behave with a child, with a sick, sick child, and there is a problem, but the link is sometimes missing, especially uh, the link between the economic cost uh, of the disease and the need to prevent uh, diseases. Uh, for example, pollution of the Lutani River has caused uh, a really big issue in reproductive health for women living uh, next to the river and also to men living next to the river. But the idea of the link between the pollution and the problem is not really uh, well, uh, well communicated uh, for, uh, between the communities. Um, same goes for skin diseases and same goes for a more positive aspect in which uh, when uh, the woman of the family acknowledges the role of nature as uh, a space for stress release and a free source of recreation, uh, it can be used for the whole family to do so. Um, so uh, as uh, a practical tool is uh, through creating uh, first awareness uh, raising and uh, opening room for discussion between the women themselves. So women get together in a rural community and talk about a certain problem uh, with each other and then maybe create um, uh, a tangible note that uh, can be communicated to the local authority or municipality that transmits uh, such problems. 
Great, thank you, Asma. That's that's really interesting. Um, I wanted to turn to Adenike now, and your your um, intervention got lots of um, responses from from people around the world, and you know, sort of this sort of inspiration of what you were saying. So, um, I just wanted to you know uh, note that uh, Martine Bellanou was was saying you made such a powerful demonstration of what integrated development should really look like, and you know, hope that you can be heard by both international organizations and donors uh, on kind of coordinated ways to approach this. And I think this is what Celia and Camille were talking about as well. Um, and uh, Nepomingi um, from, uh, from Jos in Nigeria was sort of talking about the fact that um, you're agreeing with you that, that women are the hardest hit by the effects of climate change and that these efforts need to be localized. Um, and uh, that she's adding there's a huge need to educate women in issues of climate change, particularly local women, and that, you know, there's a risk that actually people in local communities are, aren't fully aware of these, and they're seen that climate change in Nigeria is seen as an elite issue by some of these women. And so she suggests um, uh, collaboration between government, educational sector, and civil society. So I wanted to get your responses to that, but I also, if I might, just in the last couple of minutes, just link it to another question from Sophie Desmit um, on this Great Green Wall initiative, which you talked about in your intervention, led by the African Union um, on how can regional organizations concretely, concretely act to empower local communities to respond to climate change and make sure that women are heard in these efforts. So can you talk a little bit about, I guess, um, climate change being seen as an elite issue in places like Nigeria, and then how some of these regional initiatives can bring women in? Over to you. Okay, um, thank you so much. As an elite issue, I think it is due to the fact that we have um, little understanding about what is happening. Because if we have this educational background, we will know that this is, is beyond elite issues. It's, it's more like we educating ourselves, you know? Because apart from the fact that we study the, um, different courses, many people don't know that you can view climate change from different field, irrespective of whether you, are, you studied climate related courses or not. Like me, I view climate change from economics and agricultural point of view. How is it affecting our agricultural um, state? Because we are seeing that it's, it's leading to um, droughts, floods, deforestation and all of those things. When you are looking at climate change from different perspectives, you will look at this as an elite view because we know that yes, they, they emit the biggest carbon, but yet we also need to educate ourselves. Like the school where I had my undergraduate studies is, is prone to clashes between earthmen and farmer. And there's these big disparities when it comes to ethnic division and um, religious division because people are seeing it from the ethnic and religious perspective. Little people are seeing it from the climate induced factors. And that is where the problem lies. And that is why we need to educate ourselves. We need to make climate education to be universal beyond just primary, secondary and tertiary institution. We need to educate the people out there on what is needed for them to do. And we need to also, um, make people understand that we can contribute to all of these things, irrespective of where we are from or who we are. We need people to fund this issue when it comes to climate impact. So we shouldn't see it as an elite issue. We should see it as an issue that we need to deal with, irrespective of where we are from. We know that it is, it is as, um, affecting the poorer nation or um, vulnerable people, and we need due actions to be taken, but we also need that climate education. It's important. When we educate ourselves, then we'll know where the solution lies and we'll know where the problem lies. And that, was, that is why I believe in this um, opinion that um, we, we, we need to, if we don't know that a problem exists, you can't solve it. So I know that this problem exists, and that is why I'm seeking for different lenses at which we can approach it and to be solved. So we really need to look at it from different part of views, not just an elite view alone. Perfect. And Anike, I think that sums it up beautifully. The, 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 the challenge is that you, we need to educate, we need to share, we need to work together. It's not just for communities, it's not just for national governments, it's not just for the international government. We need to work together to address these issues that were so well 
put out by our speakers today. I'm afraid we've hit the top of the hour. Um, uh, I, um, and so we've come to the end of our discussion. I'm sorry I haven't managed to get to all of the questions um, that, that, that were put in, but some really important questions, some really important ideas came out there. But let me just, it just remains to me to say, thank you very much indeed to our panelists for some really inspiring ideas, some great thoughts, some really practical ways that we can all work together as Adenika was saying. It's, it's something for everybody to understand and there's a role for everybody to play in that. And uh, thank you in particular to all of our um, participants for your questions and for your engagement and your ideas. And we look forward to working with you together on this. So thank you and have a great day. And I hope to see you at some of the other London Climate Action um, Week events. International Alert have just done a really important, very useful, a publication on this which I think is being uh, a link to which is being circulated now so I encourage you to go and read that and I wish you the very best for the rest of the day and the future. Thank you. <laughs>